Incumbent to Nerds is sponsored by Shop Valerio, an online watch and sunglasses provider for men and women that ships worldwide. Use code MARK25 at checkout for 25% off your order. That's shopvalerio.com. S-H-O-P-V-A-L-E-R-I-O.com. And use code MARK25, that's M-A-R-C.25 at checkout. Thanks for listening. Hello, everybody. This is Incompetent Nerds, and today you're listening to D'Angelo, Tank, and Mark. What's up, guys? What up, yo, D? Yo, yo, yo. All right, well, we got a lot to talk about today. We do. And and we normally don't tell you heads up what we're going to get into, but I just say, why not? We're going to talk about GME. We got the expert investor, Mark, to tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> 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 We're also going to talk about Jeff Bezos, and we're also going to talk about private prisons today. So I'm just going to let, you know, the actual host, you know, Tank, I'm going to let him kick this off. What's up? What do you want to start at first? So let's start at the fact that GME didn't really hold the line today. What's up with that, Mark? So here's the thing. (laughs) 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 I don't, I mean, like... To think that it would have gone to, like, exponential numbers is, like, okay, that's a little dramatic. But here's what you also have to consider. 60% of people bought GME through Robinhood. And even when Robinhood came back and allowed people to buy GME, they only – they severely restricted it. They only let people buy – hold one share, or I think now it's up to, like, five shares. But that, I mean, that to me is like definitely market manipulation. But because of all that, people weren't allowed to buy GME as much as they want wanted to. Mm-hmm. And therefore, I believe that a lot of the short positions got closed out on Friday when it was like, I think it went out, now it's like 90 something. Yeah. So it's probably a lot. They probably just closed out early then, you know, hold on to all that debt but the short position is still around 50 percent and i think what we can learn from this is if this didn't happen i mean gamestop could have been bankrupt like last friday easily if you know they didn't get the the press and you know people didn't pump the money that they did into it i mean yes i'm sure a lot of people lost i'm just gonna hold it because I'm not going to, like, D, Warren Buffett, first rule is don't lose money. You just yep. <laughs> hold your investment till you make profit, and that's that's how it happens. But I think uh, they also, on Friday, they tried to, like, uh, I call it boomer news now, like CNBC and CNN, they were, trying, they were talking about silver. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about how people on Reddit were going after silver next, but then you look – and it was like from one post on the on Reddit from like a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting how like fake news can uh, can alter people's buying power. And Tank, you show me that um, Jim Cramer, his Bear Stearns <laughs> uh, <laughs> advice six days before it went bankrupt is is it ages well. It it really ages well. I would never take advice from that guy. Uh, what was it? There was a YouTube video about them, and I think it was that one. What they said there's, if there's three things, um, what was it? If there's three things for certain in life, that is taxes, don't believe in Jim Crowling, and uh, <laughs> death. <laughs> or no, it's don't trust him. Uh, I was dying. Yeah, and when I was an earlier investor, um, so I started in 2007. So I didn't really know what was going on. So I actually relied a lot on Jim Cramer. And mm-hmm. he cost me tens of thousands of dollars. Jeez, dude. Yeah. Uh, can you sue him? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's a, it's a show, is he, is he even a financial advisor? Like a certified financial advisor? No, but he, he used to be a hedge fund manager. Mm. I see. Yeah, and that's how I believe he actually got the show. He had some really good results with investing with his hedge fund. Mm-hmm. Um, I even think that he actually surpassed more than Buffett in some in some years too. Yeah, 
but then yeah he once he kind of joined the show then he kind of became like a puppet mm. yeah it's kind of it's kind of easy to think that like once they brought him on the show and it's like oh talk about the financial markets but it's like it's more of a reality show than it is like anything else yeah 100 percent and plus, you could just kind of see how staged it is. Like, um, if anybody's listening to my voice right now, just go ahead and just look at Jim Cramer. You're going to probably see, like, some clocks running down up to, like, milliseconds. And it's just, like, this whole little theme that he kind of has. It's a, it's a kind of make you want to buy and sell and kind of, you know, he kind of entice you on what he wants you to do. Right. Especially, so, like, yeah, the set and everything. Yeah. Right. It feels like gambling a little bit. Yeah. Because he's either like, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. And then yeah. next week, he'll he'll say the opposite about the exact same business. Right. But, I mean, my takeaways from all this were, I want to learn more about the market, D. I know you had your awakening a long time ago with your inheritance, but I, I'm motivated after this to sort of, like, take more control of like my finances and, and learn just like the different nuances of things. Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily the stock market cause that shit is shady AF. <laughs> but it, uh -huh. I do think it's helpful to like, you know, invest. I still believe what I told you, I'm sure we've talked about it before, invest in companies you believe in and companies that make good products and that you've always bought. And you know, that'll, that'll, give you some marker of success yeah and i would also like to add on to that mark you sure. also have to be able to um it's something called the intrinsic value and what the intrinsic value is is what it is actually worth what the stock is actually worth and you could actually do a formula to calculate what's the actual worth of the stock versus what is the stock price currently mm -hmm. and if it's below the intrinsic value you buy and then you hold and if it or if the company, they stay the same, have the same type of infrastructure, they don't change their debt or anything like that, and their price still drops below what you initially paid for, then you buy that, and then you hold. And then you kind of keep that same process going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how they say Warren Buffett turned $10 into $400 million with Coca-Cola. That was his strategy. Oh, okay, so Coca-Cola was very undervalued at one yeah. time. Yeah, but, well, yeah, it was undervalued because Coca-Cola was a relatively new thing at the time when he was younger. Oh, okay. Yeah, so then he just kind of, like, bought into it heavily, and then slowly you see Coca-Cola starting to buy other, you know, pop or soda companies and things like that, and they just kind of spiral out to, like, this big empire. Right, right, right. And he was one of the biggest benefactors of that. I also, I also think that, like, it's worth talking about just real quick. We're not financial advisors disclaimer, but I think you always should have like an out price. You know, it's like if you're investing stock and you're like, I want to make money then it's like, great, how much you need. And that should be your goal. And like each trade you make should get you closer to that goal. And then when you're there, you stop, you know, just like gambling, literally just like gambling. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think of it like that before earlier on, but now I'm at a point where it's like, um, so whenever I make an investment, I actually know what my expected return is going to be. And it's not going to be exact on the dime. Mm -hmm. But you kind of have to be aware of those things before you actually buy into it. So yeah. my investment portfolio now, I'm expecting 20%. And some years it's going to be better than worse, but on average around within like a 10 year time frame. The mm -hmm. average is going to be roughly about 20%. Mm. But that's because I calculated and did the math. I know how much money is going in and out of the business, how much money they're generating, and that stuff kind of reveals it all. I see. So you just stick to the stick to the numbers. You don't even, don't even look at the psychology of what people are doing. Correct. Right. Well, I, I do look at that to some degree. Um, the last episode I was telling you um, about uh, about the investor's behavior and mm -hmm. about how, how once somebody kind of buys something and starts to drive it up, what's going to basically happen is it's going to stagnate at a certain price because certain people, they aren't able to buy more at that particular price. And then people, they just panic sell. But Right. And I think that's what happened with GME and Robinhood mm -hmm. is because, A, they only let you buy one share. 
the shares are over three hundred dollars. So like right then you're mm-hmm. you're eliminating fractional shares, people just like chipping in with fifty bucks. But you're also eliminating uh people from buying more than one. So people who have a lot more money who want to buy ten shares with three grand can't do that either. Right. And I also want to ask you a question about the whole GME because, you know, I didn't participate in any of it. So you're the expert on the chat when it comes to this. <laughs> so um, who do you think were the who do you think are the winners and the losers of the whole GME situation? I mean, it, it depends on how you how you define winning and losing. If it's just from a balance sheet, uh, I think the people who definitely bought it like over over whatever it's worth now, like $93, like, yeah, you lost money, but you know, the longer you hold it, the less short, uh, hedge funds, like, you know, hopefully they stop shorting stocks over a hundred percent. Hopefully they learn their lesson. Probably not. But I think the, the lesson that you learn is, is however much that stock costs you. And if you think of it that way, you didn't lose. But if you think of it from a financial side, definitely the people lost. Yeah, because um, my my opinion, when me and Tank, we also talked about this offline on the phone, I believe maybe like a few days ago, where I honestly feel like both sides have lost because mm-hmm. of this. In terms of? Well, in terms of money, that's been the case. So you have the hedge fund managers and I also want to talk about something I actually discovered about that, too. But you have some hedge fund managers that lost billions of dollars. Just as you have some people on the opposite side that basically they put all of their money into GameStop for the mm-hmm. calls. And then they probably bought it maybe at $498 at its highest peak. And now it's at $90. Mm-hmm. So then they ended up losing fortunes mm-hmm. as well. Uh, yeah, I just think it's kind of tough for everybody. But I wanted to bring up this point with you guys. Well, which I already talked to Tank about this, but the market cap for GME went up from, I believe it was $3 million all the way up to $25 million. And if we look at the number of the Redditors, even if there's $3 million Redditors all putting in $1,000, that's only going to cover about $3 billion. So where did the remaining market cap of the actual... Where's the remaining twenty billion or whatever accounted for? And yeah. I think that yeah, and I think that I think that a lot of the hedge fund managers that people wanted to squeeze to death, I think some of them had actually came on top of this, came out on top and just became richer. Oh, because- for sure. And I mean you have to think like there had to have been some some people who who let's say you're a hedge fund that, that didn't have a, a short interest, right? Like you had a, you didn't even know about GameStop, but you saw what was happening and, you know, you took advantage of your resources and either bought the stock at a low price or, or put it, you call puts at, you know, when it was at its peak and now, you know, you're reaping all the rewards, you know, hedge funds make money when markets are volatile. They don't, they don't really make money when, you know, the markets are stable because people can just, you know, buy an ETF or buy the S&P 500 and you're going to make mm-hmm. eight to 10 percent and you're going to be happy because it's it's solid. Right. They make hedge funds exist in times like this when, you know, things are crazy and like people don't know what to believe and, you know, misinformation and chaos and, you know, what have you. So I definitely yeah. there's, there's hedge funds out there who did make money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because a lot of them, they have a lot of technology where they have bots to actually place the trades for them. And those bots have, with the algorithm, they're very, very sophisticated. And they're able to pick up on trends way before a human being could. Yeah, so, and, I, and the last mm-hmm. thing I'll say about it is Robinhood definitely, I mean, they're, they'll never say it, but they definitely were selling our data to hedge funds to make money, to make money themselves. And the hedge funds use that data to make, you know, half millisecond trades quicker and, Mm -hmm. you know, make their decision based on what, you know, retail traders were doing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. That's how Robin Hood profits. Right. And and even uh, SoFi CEO came out and said, 
that he would vow never to do that. And he he is disappointed that Robin Hood didn't even admit to that in their statement. Mm hmm. But yeah, but I guess everybody listening, if you're if you use an application for free, then you want the consumer, you're the actual product. Mm-hmm. And your data is just being sold, and that's no matter what type of app, whether if it's for finances or for exercise or just for social media, you Anything. are the product. Yeah, and sometimes that's okay, and sometimes it's not okay. Yeah, but I kind of feel like when it's a financial institution, kind of doing that, I feel like it's like really, really scummy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean like bank of america or chase they'll just they'll wrap it up and they'll say we're not using your data we're just using your data in our company so you know they'll send you they'll send you offers to be like go to dunkin donuts but like they're not going to send you a dunkin donut offer unless you've gone there three times right because they want you to spend it on your credit card and use their interest etc cetera, etc cetera. true yeah Tank, what's your thoughts on all of this? I feel like we're kind of diving down this little financial rabbit hole. And what's your take on it, Tank? I'm just listening in. <laughs> um, so with the whole thing, yeah, no. Um, for one, Robin Hood, I'm still using them for, for now. I'm already planning on moving all my shit over once I... Uh, Find a legit spot, something, and from what I'm hearing is a uh, public is a good spot. It lets you move everything over, and I think at the time when they were limiting these uh, stock buys, public was not. But then again, a lot of these places were that were not allowing you to buy, you know, GME and all these other stocks. Either they they cut it off or they're giving you these limited buys. And as Mark stated, you know, that's market manipulation right there. Uh, Publix was one of them that didn't. And now I learned, uh, I heard about Publix through Philip DeFranco. I'm guessing because of that, I'm seeing, I'm guessing because of that, they're going to get like a large number of people uh, to start joining that side and leave Robin Hood. And let's see what the hell, see what happens to Robin Hood. I mean, I'm going, I'm going to Fidelity. I mean, their app literally looks like my grandpa uses it, but <laughs> I use it to be fair. There you go, dude. You're an old man. <laughs> I use Fidelity and Vanguard. Those are kind of yeah. like my two go tos. You're gonna be teaching me how to play spades here soon enough. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I like it. They gave me they gave me a free, they gave me a free transfer. I didn't have to pay anything to Robinhood or to Fidelity, so they're transferring it over there. Um, and then, you know, transfer to the next app. I do feel bad for Robinhood because I will say this, D. You know, you know, their their hedge fund called them up and was like, You're you have too many people buying Jimmy. You need to raise your deposit because you're a, they're a broker, essentially. Mm-hmm. Robinhood just yeah. takes all their stocks, they sell them at the end of the day for the price that the people got and then they clear two or three days later. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they would never ask Fidelity or Vanguard, hey, we need $3 billion in a deposit to show that you can handle all these trades because their Fidelity and Vanguard are worth trillions. And, right. and even if they did say that to them, it's like, okay, sure, like, get out of our face. Like, we're going to keep trading to make money. True. So I do feel like they kind of, they went after Robinhood. But I mean, to me, the data thing is unforgivable, not allowing, not at least explaining why they stopped, just literally stopping in the middle of the day. Like th- nothing was wrong with the app. They just literally canceled all the trades. I mean, I was about to, I think I told Tank I was about to buy 0.1 shares at like $98 and they stopped it. So like cost me a lot. can we talk about market manipulation really quick sure sure all right and i'm actually going to pose this question to tank because you know tank is just listening so i got to bring him involved oh man (laughs) bring it all right all right so tank so let's say that you kind of have something a program like amazon or something like that okay and you're selling goods and services for other people 
Okay. But then you find out that people are using your your application that you created illegally. So let's say that um, somebody was sex trafficking people on your application. I, yeah, I, I had to bring it to the extreme. <laughs> All right, so would you step in or would you just kind of just let things happen on your platform? At that point, I had to step in. I can't be... I can't let my platforms be used for something like that of extreme. Right. Especially if there's evidence showing that this is happening on my platform. Right. Which, it makes sense. All right, now let's bring it back to the Robin Hood situation. You see that market manipulation, they hate it or love it, the Redditors are manipulating. And that is illegal. So wouldn't you want to try to stop that? Or what's your thoughts on that? Market manipulation is illegal. But yeah. how, they are, how, they are how, manipulating. How did eight people collectively working together manipulate something? Yeah, sure. So, Redditors is... And I'm totally objective about this, too. I just want you to know. I don't have a yeah. side. <laughs> right. No, but... No, seriously. But it's like you have two to three million people all basically there to just raise a price... To manipulate a price just so some hedge fund managers will lose billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. That is technically illegal. Technically. So I guess why are we looking at the people of Robin Hood trying to stop something that's like technically illegal from occurring? I mean, if you want to base it on a technicality, Jim Cramer should be in jail. CNBC should be in jail. How come how come the free market gets to mess around with the First Amendment, but when an app does it, that's when it's a problem? I think the what what's happening is that you've never had an ability to influence eight and a half million people in half a second like you do now. True. Because mm -hmm. even if you're like even if you're watching even if it's like a an old guy watching Kramer, he's like, yeah, I want to I want to buy GameStop, make some money, fuck those. Fuck those hedge funds, right? Like, he's still got to log into his account, you know, log, like, transfer his money, transfer, you know, make the trade, process the trade, pay the whatever, whatever it is, $7.95. I don't even know if they charge for trades anymore, but. Yeah, they don't. All, yeah. And that's all because of Robin Hood, which that I really appreciate. Right. So it's like they did a lot of, they lit, did a lot of good things in the spirit of the times. But the app's name is freaking Robin Hood, and they didn't they didn't necessarily stop people when they wanted to to make a decision. Right, but I only came up with that question because I'm like, is it really a wild thing for them try to prevent something that's technically illegal? I don't think it's wild for me. I'll I'll, I'll be honest with you, dude. If they would have said, "Hey, we we don't have the billion dollar deposit. Sorry, we got to restrict trade." I, I could have lived with it, but the fact that they did it in in a form of they just canceled the, they just canceled people's trades they just canceled people's accounts can't sold some people's shares I don't know if that's true but that's mm. the allegation at least right yeah you can't you can't justify that behavior in in the name of like law enforcement you know in my mm. eyes no that's fair. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to raise that question. But no, uh, on a personal tip, I feel like it's still scummy for you to try to basically prevent people from buying and selling shares. I think that's ridiculous, especially right. for a brokerage. Right. 100%. But it's, but it's not so wild that if they see something like a big trend that's like technically illegal for them to try to stop it on that platform. Right. Like, I, I get that. And I, I think I think what we're talking about is going to be the basis of the lawsuit. You know, obviously the lawyers of Robin Hood are going to argue exactly what you're arguing. Like, we we saw a market event, we tried to stop it, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, the people of the class action say like, you didn't even warn people. You know, you can't you can't do that if you're offering a service of buying and selling securities. Yeah, that's why transparency is just super important. Now, if they would have like. Now, if they would have said something like that, we would like, okay, we see a trend is kind of like illegal, so we're going to try to prevent this. 
or just give like a heads up or something like that, then maybe. But it's still a scummy thing. But but like I said, I kind of understand where they're coming from, even though I'm not on their side. Right, right. Um, well, we we kind of beat this topic to death, but um, yeah, we beat it. We beat it. We'll to death. still we'll still keep track of GME, and if anything crazy happens, we will let you guys know. Yeah. But uh, D, what was uh, the second thing you wanted to talk about? This is also stock market related, so I was I have some thoughts. But go ahead. Uh, I just want to say something before we did go on. So okay, yeah, I know we beat the hell out of it, but one more thing is invest in Dogecoin. D, what was the next topic? <laughs> <laughs> all right we got to talk about something i just found out before the cast which is we're gonna we got to talk about jeff bezos and you guys said that he was uh leaving amazon can one of you all explain the whole situation over to me again please yeah he's leaving uh, amazon as the ceo um he is gonna still be an executive chairman so he's still gonna be on the board still gonna mm-hmm. have all his shares voting power etc cetera, etc cetera. um but as a chairman, he'll be able to focus more on philanthropy. Can't even say that. Um, while at the same time, uh, still being connected to Amazon, he just won't be involved in the day to day. And there's a lot of speculation. With uh, I forgot who the new new uh, slated CEO was, but Angelo Brandon. That's what we're talking <laughs> But this guy. Um, He's basically, he doesn't care about the retail sector at all. Like your Amazon Prime membership, buying and selling, he does not care. His thing, he is in love with AWS. The AWS project was was his baby and he wants to just like take a a foot and put a stranglehold on the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andy Jassy. Andy Jassy, yeah. So I'm curious as to how you guys feel or what your thoughts on that is. Well, well, now with that information, um, I said we need a smarter guy in the market. He's a smarter guy in that position, not Andy. Because <laughs> if you look at it, they're killing the retail space. And I feel like under him, uh, retail space is going to go under. Possibly their uh, grocery line might go under. Not even go under. I see where he's coming from because out of all the most profitable things on Amazon's uh, portfolio AWS is up there and it's staying up there mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we all had this us three all had this conversation nothing out there can compete with AWS yeah Microsoft you know having Azure's cloud services and them pushing that it's just AWS has had a better start and it's continued to morph and become more and more of a better service for everybody. Yeah. And and in a way, with the since you said that AWS is his baby, yeah, if you look at the financials of Amazon, yeah, just as Tank said, AWS is like the number one primary resource for them getting all of their money. So it's understandable for them to try to go with the cash cow on this one it mm-hmm. makes perfect sense to me so i feel like them pushing all their research they might just stop certain projects under like jeff bezos approval he might just stop certain projects and constantly uh approve projects to just improve aws mm-hmm. yeah but i want to i also want to talk about how you guys feel about amazon has been in the news a long time. They employ over 1.25 million people. I think that's even more than Walmart. No, they're they're the second largest. Walmart is still second. Walmart's, Walmart's still number, number one. one. Yep. Okay. So I mean, they're second. They're number two in the in the nation for jobs, right? And they're very anti-union. So I think it's like very ironic that he's stepping down to pursue like philanthropy projects when he's like very anti-employee. If you will. <laughs> yeah. and I just want to go through some of his like funds that he mentioned in his note. So his day day one fund he launched in 2018, he devoted he wants to spend uh, two billion dollars uh, in his lifetime. You know that help uh, preschools in underprivileged areas, help people with uh, nonprofit groups, and help people alleviate homelessness. Um, and yet Amazon was literally shown as donating money to 
small state, local, and federal governments, whenever there was like a homeless or a homelessness bill passed, to not have it. So mm-hmm. basically, they were anti. They did. They wanted to keep homelessness how it was. So I think that's terribly ironic. Uh, second off, Wait. he has a, a $10 billion environmental fund called the Bezos Earth Fund. And that just it basically just donates to groups like the World Wildlife Fund, Environmental Defense Fund, Natural Conservatory. And so he has a small team and staff from his personal office to decide how to distribute the funds. That's just like that. This literally does nothing but just like donates money. So like. I don't know what he's going to do with that. Like, how do you need more time to donate money? You know, it's like (laughs) pick a charity, (laughs) call it a day, you know? Right. I was going to say, like, what does donating money against to help homelessness, what does that have to do to help Amazon? Like, what what is, like... Going against homelessness got to do for them. What is their goal to like? We we got to have more homeless people. Well, basically, I think the the from the perspective of like a marketplace is concerned. Most people who have Amazon Prime Prime specifically mm-hmm. live in the suburbs, mm-hmm. and they're the ones that spend the most money. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to see people homeless in like their backyard or at their parks. So they'll they basically pay for programs to like give them a train ticket somewhere else or, you know, whatever happens. And I mean, California, it's rampant, but I don't know what happens in other places. But if you don't essentially, if you solve the problem, then you're going to have more people with the opportunity to create smaller businesses. And if they create a business, they might stop shopping at Amazon. Mm. That's a guess. Then there's also his clock. You guys heard about this? No. Can you tell me about it? It's a $42 million clock in multiple rooms carved out of a uh, a Texas uh, mountain. And it's basically going to tick once a year for 10,000 years. I swear, when you're rich, you just do whatever the hell with your money. (laughs) Right. Whatever you want. When you're worth something billions and dollars and you got something billions and dollars in your account, you could just go ahead and buy a $45 million clock that only ticks once a year for $10,000. Not to mention, he also owns the Washington Post. Just bought it and bought it for funsies. Doesn't even live. Doesn't even live in D.C. Just bought the Washington Post. That's us. That's like us be like. Uh, I wouldn't invest in Jimmy. That's too high. I bought it. What? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All God. of this sounds like a power move to me. I think it is. And, okay, look at the, look exactly what you said. Because look at this. He's stepping down as CEO to focus on philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy. But then, but then, uh, it's hard to say, huh? Philanthropy. Yeah, uh, I can't even say it. <laughs> To focus on that, he has his own media outlet now, Washington Post. How much you want to bet he won't have cameras on him all time and journalists while he's going around, you know, doing his little philanthropy. Uh, I can't say. it's. I feel like Chris Tucker. Philanthropy. I feel like Chris Tucker with a gefilka fish. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, I just feel like it's all a power move. And, actually, let's talk about people giving money away in philanthropy. All right. So. D'Angelo Brandon. Dude, this is super lucrative to do this. And here's why. And I'm probably misspeaking because I'm not an expert when it comes to, like, foundations and things like that. But from what it seems to me, when people create, like, charities and, and things like that, you basically kind of create this this protection against taxes. Yeah. Where. You could appoint like your family members to be ahead of the foundation or whatever, and they could basically pick what they want their salary to be. And that money isn't really being this tax. It's probably not either being taxed at all or being taxed very, very little because it's like charity donation type of thing. Mm. And then you could basically do whatever the hell you want with that money. And that's why a lot of people set up that money, just like uh, the Bill Gates Foundation. It's the same thing. Or just like people say that 
Bill Gates is one of the world's biggest philanthropists, but um, what do you know that he actually like gave money to? Does any of us know? But I can tell you that his kids are ahead of it, of that little charity that he donates money to. Yeah, he said he wasn't going to leave his kids with a lot, like Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, deal, yeah, like you said, it, it's, I mean, it's a tax haven. Essentially, I mean, at least in the state of California, if you start a nonprofit, that prof, I mean, basically, that profit, like, it could actually be a profitable company as a nonprofit, as mm -hmm. long as no one ever takes, like in, in stocks, they call it like a dividend or like a bonus. Mm -hmm. As long as nobody ever gets a bonus or like, you know, you spend it on, on something. And when the company eventually is over, it the money that you make just has to be donated to another nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And essentially you save all that tax basis like you said, they they can appoint the directors, they can appoint their bonuses, their I mean not bonuses, but their salaries and their uh their increases and they can, you know, be like, Oh, we gotta go to Africa, let's take this private jet that's thirteen million dollars. <laughs> you know, there's there's no accountability. And ultimately what you said is like is it's very sad because that's why everything that Jeff Bezos is doing is the exact reason why people don't want to donate to charities, you know, cause it's, it's hard to actually see where your money goes. Right. It's a power move. And let's see. So, um, and let's go back to Warren Buffett. He donated what billions of dollars. I believe it was one time he donated maybe like 80 billion of his, uh, of his dollars or something towards a charity. Where did it go to? I have no idea. <laughs> Tank. Do you know where it went to? His charity, the Bel the Bill and Melinda <laughs> Gates Foundation. Right, but then who? After they gave it to that charity, who else received it? They I did. I don't see anything in Chicago that they kind of like helped out. I don't see like some some Warren Buffett planetarium or anything like that. Planetarium. Would be Maybe we're just not looking. Yeah, we got. We and should, to be we honest, that's and to a be, good idea. Yeah, we're not looking. Uh, to be like, honest, uh, I'm reaching. You are reaching. <laughs> <clears throat> but to be honest, I, I think, where's Bill originally from? Isn't he from Cali? No, he's uh, from Omaha. He's from okay. Omaha. Like, uh, that they go to, every time, um, every time Bill wants uh, Warren Buffett to donate, a, donate to his charity, uh, Warren says, you have to, we have to go to a basketball game. So all those pictures where it's like you see them in their like normal jeans and like belts and normal shirts that are like oversized. Yeah. They're at like a, I think it's the University of Nebraska. They're at just like the basketball games. Wow. So that's kind of kind of interesting. But let's so, see where is Bill Gates from. That's where his money's going then. Most likely his money's going to his home state, city, town, whatever, helping out whatever is going on over there. Or I think he lives in california so if anything he's donating whatever it's in cali be it no, he's born in seattle and lives in seattle yeah see then that's where the money's at because the headquarters of microsoft's in seattle and that's where his money's mainly staying yeah d he probably not donating crazy amounts of dollars in chicago or new york whatever it's staying in seattle because guess what that money's gonna come right back around and back in his pocket right so might as well keep it there he's donating there he's Whatever, probably all that's probably all that stuff he's doing is gonna be mainly there. That's like, for example, um, that's like if born and raised in Chicago, and I become a billionaire and I set up shop here and do a nonprofit organization. People like us are gonna talk shit about me, like, oh, you know, Tank is a billionaire and he's so so called donating billions of dollars. Where's that money from? Well, it's you know, it's in Chicago. I'm focusing on my people's first. Okay, that makes sense. But I still feel like those are just tax havens, and I feel like it's just it's for power. I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm stubborn when it comes to this. You no, are. I, I get it. I mean, like, hey, I know why Mackenzie Scott left Jeff. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I mean, she has she has four tweets, or no, two tweets. One of them is that she's getting a divorce, and the second is that she's leaving Amazon to uh, donate to charities. And she has over hundreds of thousands of followers. She's the 13th 
uh, richest person in the United States. Like, I'm going after Mackenzie Scott. Like, Jeff Bezos <laughs> can do whatever he wants. Right. <laughs> like, she's richer than Michael Bloomberg, and he ran for president. That's insane to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Isn't she the world's richest woman? Uh, I think Alice is the the Walton the the lady from Walmart. The, it's like oh, a it's okay. like a family, you know. Mm. Oh, okay, got it. But also, you know, it's all relative because it's all in stock, so it's like they would have to sell the stock. True. Was that the third? No, what was the third thing? D, you had a you had a topic you want to bring up too. I'm actually let Tank cover this. Tank, what's the third topic? Private prisons and Don't Biden's uh, attempt to ban them all. Well, that was your words. Veto them, to be exact. <laughs> yeah, he's going to veto the private prisons. Well, in America, because that's, that's pretty much what his approach is going to be. You think he could do it? I think so. Um I don't think it's going to be a really big fight in Congress and in the Senate about this whole private prison thing, but I could be wrong. Maybe it's lining a lot of like senators' pockets or something like that. But I think it's going to be a a pretty easy ride to kind of get rid of private prisons in America. What do y'all think? I think it's like one of those things when um, it's like one of those things that just changes. It's like people don't think about it. Because it's not it, like as long as you're not in prison, you don't think about it. It only affects like disproportionate communities. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it's a dumb, dumb, dumb concept. I mean, I'm trust me, like our our criminal justice system is terrible. Mm-hmm. But if we send someone to jail, like we better freaking pay for it. Like I don't want some but some CEO taking like a yacht ride with like American taxpayer dollars. That's like. That's like the worst to me. Yeah. And with private prisons, you were actually, well, of course, I don't know because I'm not in the system or anything like that. But it's rumored that a lot of those prisoners that are in private prisons is um, in order for them, those private prisons to make more money, they have to keep those prisoners in there for longer. So then they basically kind of give them BS infractions just so that they'll stay there longer and longer. Just so they can have a bigger check coming in. Yeah, I mean, private prisons have been banned in California for a while, and Trump tried to like sue the state of California. But um, I mean, my only experience with them is in 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 Arizona. They're really big for uh, ICE for immigration centers, and they just I mean, they look like freaking tent cities, and it's mm-hmm. like in the middle of Arizona's heat, and it's like how how is this legal? And it's like Everybody, every car, like everybody getting out of their car looks miserable. All the people going to work, all the people in there look like terrible. It's just not, it's not a good situation. Yeah. But then you have, but then it's also supporting, well, it's giving people jobs, but it's kind of like you're, you're generating money off the pain and suffering of other people. Right. And, And of course, you know, some people need to be locked up. But it doesn't mean that you got to make it hell. Like, going to prison is the actual, you know, that's that's what's going on. Like, that's the punishment, is going mm-hmm. to the prison. Yeah. It shouldn't be the punishment where it's like the CEOs keep you in here for longer or you're being abused by everybody in there. That's not what the punishment is. Right. Yeah, so I just, I just think it's scummy. Tank, what are your thoughts? Never been to prison. <laughs> no, <that's fair. laughs> no, I my thing that I'm worried. About, the only thing that that's uh, that's been in my head is, okay, say for example, he does, you know, abolishes all private prisons. Now, what's going to happen to those current prisoners? Where are they, they going to be moved to state, uh, state, local, and uh, federal prisons? And also, is there room for those places? And the whole purpose of private was that state, local, and and feds were just not, didn't have the funding, especially for the constant raising up of violence. But 
if I'm not mistaken, violence has gone down nationwide. Um, it's gone up. I mean, it, it it's was gone up, down, but it, it's gone down because of it, it has gone down overall. If you look at like, trends. yeah, overall it has gone, it's been going down and I'm guessing for what you call it for one, that's bad for private prisons, but for two, that's good for, uh, you know, government prisons. So state, local, and uh, so that way those those fucking cells are not smashed with like fourteen people in one cell. Was like the cell was only meant to fit four or five people. Right. But I mean, you also have like now people are talking about criminal justice reform, right? So it's mm-hmm. like they're putting a lot more uh, pressure on like judges and you know district attorneys to like do something for the people that are in prison. So. You know, it's like on the one hand, you're trying to prosecute like violent people who shouldn't be on the street. And at another point, it's like you have to look at every case in the last 20, 30 years and say like, oh, was this does this person need to be in jail for 20 years for using drugs that they're I can see that they're clean of now? Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I think that's one of a if you think about it from a stock perspective, D, that's one of a it's a long term it's a long-term guess on if you think uh, those companies will go to zero. Yeah. But the thing about that in general, like since we're going back to like stocks and stuff, but it's like industries, they flourish and then they fall mm-hmm. because there's never been a situation where an industry just stayed on top forever. That's never been the case. If we were in like the 1800s, we'll just be talking about how railroads are like the, the real thing, you know, but but things change over time. It's like and no uh, one knows what's going to change. But it's like a uh, like a good example. D when I told you today, uh, it's been confirmed that Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and other news sources have dropped in viewership because Trump is no longer part of the headlines. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting! I did not know that. Yep, they dropped drastically. Now they people just don't care. Because remember, Trump this, Trump that, and that was only going to last f- between four to eight years. You know, mm-hmm. just in case if he won his reelection, that was going to only last for four to eight years. And they were making tons of money on clicks, on yes. ads, everything. Television, they were constantly, it was constant bombardment. But now that they don't have him viewership drop which means less clicks which means less people viewing and it's just like oh crap we got to find the next trump what can we do now they're looking at other congressmen and women and senators and it's just failing because nobody gives a damn yeah no one cares and on top of that there are a lot of uh new youtubers that that basically kind of became famous because of you know they're making fun of trump and they finally got into politics talking about trump you also have blogs that were the same case. So, I uh, hate it or love it, but Donald Trump as a president, he was a cash cow for a lot of people. Even mm-hmm. though people made fun of him, but a lot of people wrote books. A lot of people created videos and blogs and right. news coverage. He generated a lot of money for a lot of people. Because it was content that people wanted to watch. It didn't matter what side you were on. You always want to be at the edge of your seat. And a big thing that came up is like, oh, well, everything's one-sided. And it's like, okay, well, I'm going to be the good citizen and I'm going to watch both sides. So then it's like, okay, now you're watching double the content. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. And you're just like, oh, good Lord, why is this? Uh, yeah, it's, and it's a pain. Like people, you know, people have the way they, they like to see their content. Tank is a big on YouTube. Mm-hmm. You know, I like I've been getting into Twitter this past year just because I feel like primaries like all the news articles i've read in the last year it's like oh this person on twitter said this oh read amazon's like read the jeff bezos thing from jeff bezos it's like okay i'd rather read it from his twitter than like read it on msnbc like four hours later you know true right yeah but they're gonna have to figure something out they got to figure out who's gonna be the next cash cow now yeah america America doesn't do good when we don't have a, an enemy or something to hate. I was no man. I'm so glad you brought this up because I was telling D we need another Soviet Union. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Ooh, that's very we true. Do. Right. We do. Reagan said that before he died, and and it, he's not. I mean, he wasn't wrong. 
Nope. Yeah, because we as human, be- well, us as a nation, it's like we work together once we kind of have somebody to go against. Yeah. Like, dude, when 9-11 hit, when the 9-11 situation hit and I was in grammar school, I've never seen so many friendly people in my entire life. Everybody was just trying to make sure everybody was cool, taken care of. Everybody was helpful. But that's kind yeah, of imagine if you're a Muslim. common enemy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would have been the opposite. But... but yeah, but as a nation, we kind of strive and think when we have a common enemy. For sure. We do. Because look at the glory... I won't even say glory days, but if you look at the how America was advancing from 1945, 1946, all the way to 93 when the Soviet Union failed. That's what fall, uh, burned, fell, whatever. That's what you will say. Uh, we were just pushing it. Technology, mm-hmm. social, everything was just being pushed. Yeah, there was a bunch of dark ass shit in our history. But at that time, America had a common enemy. Everybody, no matter if you were left or right, you were kind. You guys met the people met in the middle ground, especially right. if it had to deal with a commie. Now mm-hmm. it's just like, well, my next door neighbor's a commie, <laughs> and we're <laughs> right. cool people. Yeah, yeah. By this point, That's it's not like we need a Soviet Union or we need to like gear up and. You know, combat China and their fucking global takeover. You know what we need? We need another episode on Incompetent Nerds next week on this topic. I like that. I'm cool with that. (laughs) We need to fight against, like, aliens or something so we can all band together. That will reunite the entire Earth. (laughs) If we had, like, a space enemy, bro, come on. 100%. Reagan said the same thing. Independence Day, baby, part two. <laughs> right. But let's go ahead and end it on that note. We'll probably have a this conversation next week. Definitely. What can unite us all? Donut King. <laughs> <laughs> what well, already, ladies and gentlemen? That has been an incompetent nerds podcast. I'm your host, Tank, Mark, and D. We'll catch you guys next time. Peace. Peace. Bye.